Hello, I'm Carl Eulen Halverson, and you are watching Living Green on a Blue Planet. We're living in a time of climate change. Sea levels are rising, species are becoming extinct, we are encountering environmental refugees. It's easy to despair and, and give up hope, but we don't have that luxury. Luckily, locally and globally, there are individuals who are making real difference. They are making lifestyle differences or changes. They are creating new technologies and rediscovering ancient ways of caring for the land. And combined, uh, they provide us with ways of becoming a little greener every day. And so that's what this program is going to be about. We're going to be interviewing local uh, scientists and researchers and naturalists, uh, but also hobbyists and people who just work at being uh, greener in their in their own homes, their own gardens, their own businesses. Uh, and tonight we're going to introduce you to a special program, the Indiana Master Naturalist Program. Now every state has a Master Naturalist Program, and these are programs that are designed to take people who who love nature and may have their own special area, maybe it's insects or reptiles or, or local history, uh, but train them to be generalists so that they can be uh, useful volunteers for state parks, county parks, city parks, and, uh, and, and nature programs, environmental agencies, those type of things. Each state has their own programs because each state has a different history and very different geology, uh, but also areas of the state have their own programs because they have different uh, geographies again, but also uh, resources. So in Allen County, uh, we have uh, two county parks. We have a city park uh, that has a farm. We have uh, a university that has an environmental resource center. And so we're going to use all of those um, uh, resources. So this will be an introduction to the Allen County, Indiana Master Naturalist Program. The program um, is pretty intense. It starts the last week of uh, February and goes through uh, June. It meets weekly, sometimes twice a week. Uh, there are quizzes, reading, um, field trips, uh, and so it's pretty busy. There's a tuition, and so we're not going to be showing you the whole program. Uh, what we will be doing is providing a sampler so that if you're interested, you can say, hey, I think I'd like to be a master naturalist. And at the end of the video, we'll have a link so that you can uh, search out the Allen County Indiana Master Naturalist Program in case you want to sign up for it for next year because they do fill up pretty quickly. So that's what we're doing. Hope you enjoy it. Um, take care. Okay, let me introduce our, our first speaker this evening. Her name is Natalie Haley, and you'll be seeing her around quite a bit. She's been with the Allen County Parks uh, Department for about 13, 14 years, right? A little bit more, but that's a little more than that, maybe about 15. Uh, she currently is the manager for Fox Island Park. She got that position right before all of this fell through. Uh, she has her Bachelor of Science degree from Purdue University. We're going to see where, where all the colleges are here. In wildlife science, uh, while at Purdue, she worked as a laboratory technician field and field technician. Uh, she was a former naturalist for the Indiana Department of Natural Resources at both McCormick Park and Raccoon State Park. Uh, she was an intern at Chicago's Brookfield Zoo. She is a veterinary tech at a veterinary clinic in Muncie, Indiana. She got her certification, and if you don't know about this program, someday she'll tell you about it, a certified interpretive guide uh, certification under the National Association of Interpretation. And she currently serves on the state board for Indiana Master Naturalist. So I'm going to let turn this over to her. All right. <laughs> you guys are my guinea pigs, I'll be honest. This is the first time I've talked about this in front of a group. Um, so if I get tearful, just you know, ignore the tears. Um, so I started as a park manager shortly before COVID hit. Um, we were going strong, doing really well programming. COVID hit in 2020. 
and um, we initially shut some things down, <laughs> like most places. And then we then we thought about it a little bit after we all kind of adjusted and we were like, okay, do I want to work from home forever or what? You know, it's kind of hard to be a naturalist and work from home. Uh, so I lasted about two weeks and I begged my superintendent to let me back in. And we wore masks and went to our desk and sat and tried not to move and spent a lot of time outside. Um, which changed how we programmed. We used to do indoor programming in here in the classroom and, and then we started just doing everything outside. And we actually shut down the nature center. Um, gosh, I don't know how many months, at least over a year. Um, and we thought we would see less visitation, there'd be you know, less people wanting to be around other people. And like every park in the nation, <laughs> we were inundated. Um, so it was good we didn't have the buildings open because we didn't have the staff to keep them sanitized. Um, there was access to the restrooms, so that was able to keep that going. Uh, but we came out of that, and then I think we had our first really good spring. We started to see school groups come back, and we started to see um, interest in, in, in a lot of field trips from public schools, not just parochial schools. Um, and then in June of last year, we had a storm. So um, I'm going to talk about that. <laughs> so this, this fellow here, anybody, somebody's in walleye conservation. I noticed there's a couple of people in that. If you've not heard of Otto Leopold, you need to find out who that guy is. <laughs> He's the father of wildlife management, um, meaning he pretty much came up with the concept that wildlife needs to be managed. Um, he was also in one of the for first, if not the first, school of forestry for Yale Forestry. Um, so for his time, he was right at the, at the beginning of all his concepts, um, understanding that there was an ecosystem and all of that. I like to have this slide here because it really talks about what happened here. Um, and you'll, I'll talk more about that during the, during the presentation. Um, but it's easy when I work for a system and nobody's watching, I can make decisions that are quick and easy, but are they the right decisions? for the ecosystem. Um, and so that's, even though it's legal, is it the right decision for that ecosystem? Um, so derecho. <laughs> derecho is a Spanish word, and it means straight winds, um, direct straight, literally. Um, it's, a, it's a line of intense winds, and I'll explain exactly what that is. Because I'm an educator at heart, you have to know exactly what it is. <laughs> And you will be quizzed on this, but all this information is in the 12-page report I gave you. <laughs> Minus some of the photographs. I don't have all the photographs. Um, so how is a derecho different from a tornado or a hurricane? Um, derechos can exceed hurricane speeds. Hurricane speeds can get up to about 78 miles an hour. Tornadoes, obviously, as we know, the fronts will twist. They'll rotate. Um, derechos aren't. They're straight for the most part. They could be between 58 mile an hour, or as in our case, 98 or more miles an hour, um, which has never been reported here, by the way, <laughs> before. Um, so to get really technical with it, um, you know, I don't think people understand exactly how this could all, you know, happen or how this forms. Um, so I, I have the, the diagram here to explain that when rain comes out of a cloud, it cools the air, okay? So you have the rain cooled down draft. <coughs> Does this have a pointer on it that's not working? Yeah. There's red oh, there. It's, it was wore out. Sorry, I couldn't see red. So, um, so you have rain coming out of the clouds. That's cooling the air, right? Uh, as a thunderstorm reaches their surface, it'll spread horizontally in front of it, forming a bow or a gust front, okay? And you can kind of see where that's at. Right there, right? Um, when the cool, dense air in front hits the lighter, warmer air in front of it, it forces that lighter, warmer air over the cool, dense air, okay? Um, oops, look the wrong way. And so, those gusty winds can form that, and as it does that, it actually spreads the bow and expands. Um, and derechos can be miles wide. Um, in fact, some of the parks north, 
west of us, uh, like Crooked Lake, Chain Lakes, a lot of those were hit before it came through Fort Wayne. Um, and so, this is what it looks like when the warm air gets pushed up over the cool, dense air. You get this huge shelf plop. Okay? And I'm sorry if you can't see. <laughs> so, and I do have that link. I, I highly recommend you look at that link if you're having trouble understanding what I'm saying. Um, they do a very good, um, and so does NOAA. Um, so I wanted to give you that link as well. Um, that's where I got my information when I was trying to figure out how to describe this for people was from those two links, okay? Um, so a downburst, okay. So a downburst is a general term used to broadly describe macro and microbursts. Downburst is the general term for all localized strong wind events that are caused by a strong downdraft within a thunderstorm. While a microburst simply refers to an equally, especially small downburst that is less than two and a half miles across. Okay, and we think that's what hit Fox Island was a downburst. And this is what it kind of looks like. Um, this, I think this picture was taken over Kansas, so it's not a localized picture. Um, so and I believe that other microbursts occurred throughout the Little River Valley, uh, over in Waynedale, uh, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. um, so this is a nice visual representation that a friend of ours, a, a volunteer at the park, she tracked the thunderstorms, okay? So during that night. And so lighter, warm air force up over cool, dense air may give birth to more thunderstorms. So if you look at the time frame here, this is 1036 on June 13th. And then the one on the right is at 1037. So you can see almost exactly when that microburst was forcing that warm air up over the cold air and causing all the thunder strikes. Um, and just for your information, there's the airport, and Fox Island's about up here from the airport, I imagine, about right in here. So. <laughs> wow. Yeah. And we did have staff on site. Um, we had a, our maintenance foreman and his wife live on site where Ron Zartman and them used to live, if you know Ron Zartman. Um, and it was pretty impressive, I hear. I lived in Auburn. I was clueless. Until the next morning, I started to read the news <laughs> about 6 a.m., and I was like, oh my gosh, what's going on at work? Um, so according to uh, Derecho Climatology, hosted by the National Weather Service, we should get one of these storms once in our area, in Indiana, every year. Maybe not at that level. We might get a 58-mile-an-hour windstorm versus a 98-mile-an-hour so it had been a few months um, since we began the initial plant. Was it like eight months now? Um, the day prior to the storm was beautiful. It was sunny. We had day campers out here. We had like 30 different volunteers out here with kids uh, for a two-hour uh, day camp, nature camp, run by the Alliance and Sarah Malloy. Um, and she organized the whole thing and just used our facilities. And it was beautiful. You would never know. <laughs> and the roof we just had installed wasn't even inspected yet, but it was almost complete. So $160,000 roof on this building. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> so when I got the, the inclination, or I started to clue in that there was, it was pretty bad at work, I called Mike. He said, don't come to work. Can't talk to you. Don't come to work. And he didn't even answer his phone, he just texted that to me. And I thought, oh my gosh, I've got a nature camp, we've got hundreds of kids coming, we've got 30 volunteers coming, it's her first time running the camp with us, what are we going to do? So I called her up, recommended that she cancel it right away, because she had all those people she had to contact. She was not going to give up. She wanted to have camp, and so she, did, she insisted on trying to meet me at the gate to you know, talk to people and try to figure out what we could do. We had no electricity, we had no water, so we could not have CAM. Uh, we just didn't even have uh, sanitary facilities for the kids. Um, so she met me, and we were down uh, by the Quonset Hut on Yawnee Road. We couldn't even get to the gate, because Yawnee Road was blocked with logs all the way down it. Um, I 
turned around several vehicles on myself. We had a highway department truck pull in. We threw cones out because people were trying to get through it anyway. And um, yeah, I, so we turned that around and I went brand straighter around Smith and came around and I saw a lot of devastation in the Waynedale homes in their yards. People were out like, oh my gosh. And I came around through Smith and I could get in the park. The front of the parkway really doesn't look that bad when you come in even now. Um, we've done a lot of debris cleanup up front recently, but it really wasn't that bad and it's very deceptive. Um, we could get to the four-way stop and all of that. Um, so there's our superintendent and Mike, and that's the equipment we had to clean this up, basically. <laughs> we had two tractors, some chains, some chainsaws. You know, we don't have what the big city parks or big state parks would have to clean this up. Um, so, well, we didn't even have personal access to restrooms. I mean, we have a pit toilet, and that's what we used for the first three days. <laughs> So we were lucky. We had all of our electricity was underground with transformers, and so we were back up and running with that and water in three days. So we were we were blessed that way. Um, but it was 90 degrees out. Do you remember that week? 90 plus degrees. Uh, so we started investigating the trails, and I've given you guys a flyer, or I don't know if she's got it in the back. If you have a flyer that says Black Oak Speaks, it's a story. That was written by Cynthia Powers. She's one of the birders you'll probably meet during the birding class. Um, she wrote it quite a long time ago, before my time, um, during the bicentennial period, talking about the oldest tree in the park. And that was a black oak. And black oaks only typically live about 150 to 200 years. And this one was well over 200 and a quarter. So I knew the likelihood was that it would be down on the ground. And so when I climbed down the main trail, it took us, Dan, how long did it take us? He was with me that day. 40, 45 minutes. Yeah, to go down a trail that you're going to go on with the uh, IMN Geology hike, and you're going to see how short that was. And uh, you'll see the old black oak there off to the side. I have some flagging on it still. Um, so we made it to that tree, and it's just one of the saddest things. You kind of expect it, and when you see it, you're going to see why it's completely hollowed out. But it's just sad to see old trees laying down. Um, and after the initial week of cleaning up the roads, just so we could access the buildings and make sure the staff had emergency access out of the park, so Mike and Kelly could get to the grocery store, <laughs> things like that, um, I was asked to go and assess how bad it was in the park, in the rest of the park. And so I started hiking the trails, and a hike that normally takes me 35 minutes took me five hours, because you're climbing over log after log and under, I mean, it's just, you can't, just, you, can, you can't explain it. I've never seen anything like it in my life. Um, so this is the tree trail, which is just a, was a beautiful area of the park where we had really old um, oaks like this one, white oaks and tulip trees and, and you know, um, so this, where it's at, yeah, it's a couple feet off the ground, but it was above me, you know, above this big round, beautiful tree. Um, and then here's a beautiful tulip tree. And they haven't even gotten to this part of the park yet, just so you know, I mean, I'll explain how far they've gotten. Um, it was weird, I was standing there and I could smell black oak. If you know that smell, it's not a pleasant smell. It's like skunk and sassafras. It just was pungent in the air. Uh, it was hot. There were no mosquitoes. There was no canopy. So sun was hitting the ground in areas that had not seen sunlight for like 100 years. And so I didn't get inundated with mosquitoes, but <laughs> it was weird. It was really weird. Um, Oh, and then the tree, these, this is a, like a root ball. It's 20 feet high, and it's created a hole in the trail that's about six feet deep or more. Um, so we have to reroute a trail. And you're in the nature preserve. So you're not supposed to be rerouting trails. <laughs> you're supposed to be leaving these trees, cutting a hole through them, and leaving it. Well, there's an area on this particular trail where there's four trees piled up on top of each other this big. And, and I'll show you some other areas that, like this is the dune. And if you know what it was like to stand at X at the dune, 
it, you can't recognize where you're at. I mean, and I've, I've been on this trail hundreds of times. And coming back from that to the center trail, I got lost on a trail that I've hiked hundreds of times. And so I had to circumvent. I kind of knew the area enough to know I, had, I could go down the dune and get back to the center trail and get back out. But I was out of water by then. And I started thinking, how are we ever going to open this up for anybody to come in and, and walk the trail safely? They're going to get stuck out there, you know. Um, so this is what it looks like out at the dune. Um, and so a lot of snap-offs. Um, a lot of this kind of thing happened where, you know, everybody at first thought it was because of our sandy soils. The wind just pushed them through the sand. So you can see these are still rooted in. They're just snapped. And I mean, just, it was about 15, 20 minutes storm, and it just annihilated us. Um, so these are on the lower dune. This was out almost to the lake road. Um, and we couldn't find the frog pond for a while. <laughs> um, so the frog pond is underneath all the trees in there. And it was, if you're familiar with the frog pond, anybody been out here and seen the frog pond? Um, that was a test site for Bowman Lake. They were gonna, you know, where to dig the, the bar, get the borrow pit soil and have water hold and make a lake back in like the 60s or whatever. Um, this was a test site and they left it and it's been our frog pond since then. And so there's a lot of um, bullfrogs and green frogs and, and tiger salamanders and things like that that live in it. Um, so then we had, um, Homeland Security offered to help us out, and they brought in drone. Um, and they know how to get through the airport security and keep under the deck that's required for drones in this area because we're in the line of planes, so we can't just fly drones anywhere out here. Um, and this is one of the one of the more obvious pictures that they they took. And this is the north side of Bo Bowman Lake. So probably more than halfway down the north side. It was just a complete lay down. And behind it, there was a lot of dead trees from when we got flooded a few years back. Mm -hmm. um, you guys have probably seen that, especially if you've been volunteering at Eagle Marsh. You'll see the whole backside of Bugs on all these dead trees. Mm -hmm. And I can smile about that now because I know it's brought in northern long-eared bats and red-headed woodpeckers, and you know, so it hasn't been all bad news. But when they put in the berm, it didn't drain as well as the engineers had thought it would. And so it flooded our cottonwoods and our soft maples to the point where it killed them. So that was already there. But back from the backside of Fox Island to this area and to the north of the lake road, all the way up to behind the buildings of the center trail, it's just almost totally down. Okay? So you think it's bad out here, <coughs> it's worse. Um, so this is just where I'm talking about kind of what it was like uh, to do the assessments. Um, the birds and insects were everywhere. It was crazy with dragonflies, especially. Um, and the mosquitoes were not as present as I had anticipated. Um, in the end, every day I would get back to the Geo Garden um, or to the Vera Doolin building and just kind of hose off <laughs> with the hose because <laughs> you're, just, you're just hot. And um, what really became apparent to me, um, I didn't even go through all the trails. I went through the majority of the trails is that at a certain point you just realize you can't just leave it, okay? You can't just cut the logs open and leave it. There's too much. Um, if we were to do that, the logs would sit there rotting for at least 20, 40 years. And if you know anything about invasives, it's just going to become invasives. Um, they'll just, they're just waiting for that sunlight to hit them, and they're just going to come up like so um, we had an option. We had to decide, do we open up the back of the park? Do we even ever open up their nature preserve? Do we let it go, you know, to invasives? Or do we let loggers in? Which I never thought I would even ever consider. Um, th this photo really solidified it for me. Um, this is from the marsh overlook to the lake road and it's 80 to 100 acres, and it's just 
Um, and I thought, there's no way that we can, with tractors and chains and a couple chainsaws, even begin to get this off the forest floor so that I can replant. Um, a lot of people have come up to me or sent me messages saying, well, why don't you let the debris, you know, at least, and I said, oh yeah, there's plenty of debris. <laughs> because the loggers only want the logs. And if you look at a tree, you have all of those branches and you have all of that material that they don't want. So it's still here on the site, no matter if they took the log or not. And that will eventually break down. Um, it'll probably take 10, 10 to 20 years. Um, we'll burn a few just around the buildings to make it look a little nicer. Um, but if you burn, and I'll talk a little bit more, that, that can cause some issues as well um, with planting. So this is my last picture I have of the old black oak tree. It was actually a homeschool parent that took it and sent it to me uh, when she heard about the storm. So, and this is just me talking about that. <laughs> um, and so every specialist I talked to said, you've got to get your hands on the invasives. In any way, shape, or form, you've got to get rid of the seed source. Ideally, I would cut each one, treat the stump, so it doesn't re-sprout. We have let this go at this park for way too long. We have acres of invasives. Because my focus was education. We didn't have staff or a budget for invasive management. And so we did a little bit to try to educate the public, but we definitely, I never thought we would ever be able to manage the invasives at Fox Island um, in the next 50 to 100 years. Because we didn't have the continual resources um, being fired at. Um, so one benefit of all this is that while the loggers were logging, um, I was borrowing or renting equipment like this and going into our heavier areas and removing the invasives brutally with a fecon mulcher machine. It's a forestry mulcher. And it just chews it up. It doesn't, you're not spreading herbicide. You can't spread herbicide on something like that. So that means in two or three years, I've got to watch all the re-sprout come up. And in two or three years, I have to do a foliar treatment in those areas. So then I have to look, do I want to put that amount of herbicide in those areas, okay? So the areas that I did it were in the younger part of the park, the younger forested part that were kind of fields of it. Um, and I'll show you some more pictures of that. But before doing any of this or making all these decisions, I don't get to make these decisions by myself, right? I have a park board, I have the state nature preserves, I have a lot of people that would be um, wanting to have a say on what we did and what we did not allow here. So, number one was State Nature Preserves. So, they came in for a switch Dunbar. He was coming in, they didn't have a position for him. Um, his, the person that normally would come to Fox Island, they didn't have anybody in that position. They had left and they didn't have it filled yet. They didn't fill it till July. So, Rich came down from Crooked Lake. Um, he's been with the State Nature Preserves for decades. And he was dealing like, with his own storm damage, Crooked Lake. And he was one of the old school nature preserve people. Just leave it, let it lay, let it go back to nature. That's the way I felt as well.